going to turn to your hymnals to page two. We'll sing Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Go ahead and stand as we sing Come Thou Fount.
160, and we'll sing three verses of For the Beauty of the Earth, and you can remain seated as we sing this through. We'll sing one more song, page 29, Creation Sings. Go ahead and stand, and as we sing the first verse, the children are dismissed to Children's Church. This morning, we are gathered together, and uh, I trust that you did have a very good Thanksgiving, <clears throat> Thanksgiving day, a very good time together with family over the Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, Thanksgiving is one of those things you can never do too much. Never do too much of Thanksgiving. This morning, I just want to start asking you a, a question. You know, it's always interesting to see when two separate and equally valuable products get paired up together. 
uh, and to combine their forces. And so since we've gone through Thanksgiving, we probably all uh, had lots of good food. Uh, food is on my mind. Uh, I'll use that as an illustration. But, uh, you know, you think about breakfast food. And if you, somebody says pancakes and sausage, that was what I thought of. All right. Th this is not family feud. All right. All right. We, we won't. That got 27. All right. Uh, eggs and bacon. Uh, you know, this thing, they just, they go together so well, you know. They, what's that? Eggs and tomatoes. For some people, those go together. I, won't, I will refrain from any comment about people who think eggs and tomatoes. Although omelets, green peppers, and all sorts of stuff goes well with that. Uh, you know, you, you think about lunch food. Ham and cheese. Ham and cheese sandwich. I mean, what could go better together than that? Or peanut butter and jelly. Or some people, peanut butter and chocolate. Um, you like peanut butter and chocolate? How many of you are Reese's peanut butter kind of people? All right, good stuff. Peanut butter and Nutella. Chocolate hazelnut spread. Good, good stuff. All right, all right. You know, to each their own. Uh, you know, when you think about Thanksgiving dinner, turkey, mashed potatoes, Dressing, cranberry sauce? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you that one. I'm not a big cranberry guy, but apple pie and ice cream. Anybody have apple pie and a slice of cheese? That's another good kind. Those things, they just go together. They fit. And when they come together, it's something special. You know, you, you enjoy that. Now, it's still another hour or so till y'all get to eat, so we'll get our mind off of food now. But the reality is just like we know that there are certain food choices that just, they just fit, they go together, and when they're together, it makes for something really special. In the same way, there are spiritual realities that just fit together so well, and when they are put together, they have a powerful impact. And I want you to look with me at a passage of Scripture this morning that merges two of those things in great number. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't talk about food at all. But it does talk about things that are great spiritual blessings. The two things that go together in this chapter are things that we've been talking about, and that's why I picked it. Uh, we've been going through a series on the abundant Christian life, things that we have in abundance, things that we ought to offer up in abundance, things that we will receive or share in abundance. And that, that's an important part of our life because God doesn't want the Christian life to be sterile and 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 Spartan. I mean, God wants to bless our lives in incredibly abundant ways. Sometimes the problem is we're just looking in the wrong places, and we miss some of that abundance. There's also another theme that we're going to look at, and that is, what, what holiday have we been celebrating this week? Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving is not, should not ever be relegated to one week on the calendar. It should be an every day, every moment kind of an attitude of heart. It should, it should make us who we are. It should be, communicate what we are. And if you, if you take abundance and thanksgiving together, you have 2 Corinthians 9. Look, look at the chapter with me. I'm just going to let you look and see how often these words appear here. Let's, let's take the first word. Let's take abundance. There's other synonyms for it, you'll see, but the same idea. Uh, look at verse 6. It talks about, He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. That's abundance. Uh, verse 11, you can see that idea. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. And we'll see what that's talking about later. Uh, look at verse 8. God is able to make all grace 
abound toward you. Verse 12, for the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Verse 13, a different word. It talks about, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Now, it's not liberal as opposed to conservative. It's liberal as, a, as in the sense of generous, overflowing in abundance. It's just liberally applied, liberally distributed. And look at verse 14. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Because of the exceeding grace of God that's been manifested in one group of people, the other group of people has a deep longing for them. Exceeding amounts of grace. And, and you can see the words that, that illustrate that second theme that fits together here. Look at verse 11. Their attitude, their actions, it says, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. I mean, something that had taken place, something that had occurred, that involved a number of different people, groups all functioning together, resulted in thanksgiving being poured out unto God. Look at verse 12. And it says, but in a is abundant also by many thanksgivings to God. I mean, there was thanksgiving flying off the shelves, like boxes off a, a Black Friday store shelf. I mean, thanksgiving was, was being thrust upward to God from people's hearts, thanking God, thanking God, thanking God, thanking God. They were just overflowing with thanksgiving. And look at verse 15. The greatest thanks of all it says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We'll come back to that. But it is unspeakable. It doesn't mean you can't talk about it. It just means no matter how much you talk about it, you can never exhaust the depths of, of that gift that causes us to be so eternally grateful. So, so there you have it. I mean, we're looking at abundance, overflowing, exceeding, bountiful, and thanksgiving, thankfulness, giving of thanks. Those two things go together better than peanut butter and jelly, better than peanut butter and Nutella. I mean, they go better together better even than, than turkey, mashed potatoes, and gravy. The fact is, those are things that God purposes and intends that whenever those two things show up, his people just can't stop thanking him. They can't stop operating and doing things in abundance. So what, what, what's all that abundance about? What is all that giving of thanks all about? Well, let, let's, let's think first, before we look at this chapter, about the words of the Lord Jesus it's not listed in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul tells us. So it was well known among all of the Apostles. They knew that Jesus has said this. Perhaps he'd said it many times. And he said he wanted to remember those brothers he was writing to. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, that's not taking away anything from receiving. Is it a blessing to receive a gracious gift from the hand of somebody who loves you, who loves God? That is an incredible blessing. This passage even talks about that in 2 Corinthians 9. It is an even greater blessing to give of ourselves, to give of our resources, our time, our talents, and our treasures, to give unto the Lord, to give things for the Lord. And it says that person who with the right heart motive gives generously, it is more blessed to give than to receive. They actually get more and greater blessings even than the person who receives that gift. And this chapter, 2 Corinthians 9, talks about the abundance of God's grace, the abundance of God's blessing, the abundance of thanksgiving that is offered up when people let God work in their lives, and they choose willingly, eagerly, voluntarily to give generously. 
It's not just something they do, it's something they are. And as we look at this passage, I want us to see some things for which we should be ready to give thanks. If you would look with me, uh, beginning in verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let's, let's thank God. So what should we thank God for? Let's thank God for believers with generous hearts. Let's thank God. I mean, I'm surrounded by people who are generous. It's a wonderful thing to know how many people are eager to invest in the lives of others, eager to invest in missionaries so that people around the world will hear the truth of the gospel. I mean, this church has been sustained for a hundred and almost 75 years, 1847, because it's been filled decade after decade, generation after generation, filled with generous people who love God. Look, look what it says in verses 6 and 7. We, we all know how wonderful it is to receive a blessing. But what kind of blessings do people receive? Uh, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. First of all, generosity provides a bountiful return in blessing. Look at verse 6 and 7. Paul is writing to the, these people and encouraging them to, to follow through on some commitments they made. They, they voluntarily said, hey, Paul, count us in. We want to participate in that offering to help all the underprivileged saints who are really struggling with hardship there in Jerusalem and Judea. And he's following up to encourage them. And he says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, generosity provides a bountiful return and blessing. Generosity shows the heart of God that he desires to bless his children. I mean... I don't know how many of you grew up on a farm or you visited a farm or maybe even worked a farm. But, you know, the farmer who skimps on sowing seed, eh, I'll plant a little seed over here and a little seed over there. And, eh, you know, I, I think that'll probably be enough. He's not going to get a big abundant harvest. He's not going to fill those silos. He's not going to fill those hay wagons. He's not going to have an abundance to use for his livestock and a surplus to sell in town. It's just not going to happen. You plant sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. But the illustration follows that if, if we sow um, bountifully, there's coming a time when we will reap bountifully. And we, we know that that's true in things like um, farming. I had a professor who used to always pray before every exam in college that I had him for a class, and he'd say, Lord, please bless these students abundantly as they take this test in accordance with the way they studied. Oh, hated that last part. Hated that. Lord, I was hoping you'd bless me way beyond what I deserve. But, you know, the, the fact is you studied hard. God blessed you with good results. And here we have a picture that God wants to bless his people, but by faith, he's wanting his people to sow bountifully, and he will let them reap bountifully. And look at verse 7. He, the way he wants us to sow bountifully so we can reap bountifully, it says, every man giving, sowing and reaping, according as he purposes in his heart. God wants our giving to be motivated by our hearts, overwhelmed by his love and, and just so impressed by his faithfulness, just in awe of his majesty, that it's, it's a privilege to give, isn't it? I mean, that, that's the, the point he's trying to make here, that we should purpose in our heart. And, and if our heart is wanting to give premeditated, I mean, premeditated is not always a bad word. We, we most frequently think of it in connection with murder. But premeditated giving, I purpose, I choose, I plan, I anticipate the privilege of giving. 
And every man, as according as he purposes in his heart, and what is the attitude that God loves? If you look at the end of verse 7, it says, For God loves a cheerful giver. You know the, the, the Greek word for that, I'm not expecting anybody to know Greek, but you know the English word, what it sounds like. Hilarious. I mean, we, we get our English word hilarious. I'm overwhelmed with laughter and, and, and exuberance. He wants us to have an exuberant attitude about the privilege of giving. Notice the other attitudes that should help us purpose in our heart. He says, so let him give. That is, purpose and choose and plan and follow through because God has moved upon his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, Not grudgingly, as not reluctantly. We, we should give with sincerity. He says, nor of necessity. Don't give because I feel like I've got to. I don't want to give because if I don't give, somebody's going to say something and somebody's going to hassle me. And, you know, if I don't give, bad things will happen. So I want to rub the magic genie bottle and I'll give so good things will happen. Not that at all. That he wants us to give not of necessity, not under compulsion that we feel like we're, our arm is twisted, but that we should do it spontaneously, that it flows from our heart. And that we should be cheerful givers, that there's a, a joyful willingness. And it says, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a sincere giver. God loves a spontaneous giver. That God loves generous hearts because God's heart is generous, right? And when we give generously, whether it's our time, our talents, our treasures, we're showing forth the likeness of God through our life. Generosity reminds us of God's heart. And generosity is enabled by God's work in our lives. Look at verse 8. Not only does it show our heart, but it shows us that God is working in our hearts. It says in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Notice the emphasis. All, 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 every. Abound. I mean, the fact is, God wants to work in people's lives to help them abound with opportunity, to abound with resources so they can abound in showing generosity. Did you know one of the reasons God prospers us is so that we might have more than we need so that we can give to those in need? Don't steal any longer, but rather work hard with your hands so that you might have to give to those in need. And the fact is, God blesses us and gives us abundance. God provides unique opportunities and resources. He moves in our heart so that we would be able, He'd make all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency or ability in all things may abound to every good work. That we'd be able to follow through on our heart's desire to have a passion to give, to glorify God, and to meet needs. That, that, God, God wants to bless that kind of generous heart. It doesn't mean that we're all going to have bigger houses and more cars and bigger, fatter bank accounts. It doesn't mean that we'll all have second homes, that we'll all be able to fly first class. It doesn't mean that we'll all be able to buy any food we want whenever we want at the grocery store. It doesn't mean that. But it means that God will provide the means for the people who are eager and willing to be a means of God's blessing for his work. He, he provides for us so that we can share our provision to further the work of the Lord. And God will abundantly bless, not just in material terms, but in spiritual terms. God is able to make all grace abound. And it's not talking about the grace of salvation. Grace means a gift. Salvation is a gift. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But here he's talking about the gifts he gives to us. He gives us 
sustaining grace. He gives a saving grace. Here he provides provisional grace, an opportunity to use those resources to serve the Lord and make a difference in the lives of others. Well, we're going to pass over verse 9 and 10 right now. They're, they're quotations from Psalm 112 and Psalm, uh, Isaiah 55, reminding us of how the Lord provides for his people to enable them to be used by him, that he works through his people to accomplish his purposes. I, I was reading a, a, a chapter in a book written by one of my favorite authors, Warren Wiersbe. And he said this, As a pastor, I have watched young Christians lay hold of these principles of grace giving and start to grow. It's been a great joy to see them trust God as their giving is motivated by grace. And as they've, they've received God's grace, they want God's grace to work in and through them. At the same time, I have seen other believers merely smile at these principles and gradually impoverish themselves. Some of them prospered financially, but their income was their downfall. It did not enrich them. They had their reward, but they lost their opportunities for spiritual enrichment. And he ends this with this statement. Giving by grace means that we really believe that God is the great giver, and we use our material and spiritual resources accordingly. You simply cannot outgive God. Do you believe that? God loves cheerful givers who premeditate in their heart that I will give sincerely and spontaneously, joyfully, that I'll be thrilled with the opportunity to do something of eternal significance on this earth, in this life, allowing material things, just stuff, money, greenbacks, whatever you call it, that I'll allow God to work through all of that and I will receive a flood of blessing in return. It may not be dollar for dollar, thing for thing, but when we are willing to let God work in our heart and through our hands, God floods us with the joy and blessing that is his. I want you to look at verse 12. This is just a short little thing. It's kind of sandwiched in the middle of two, two principles. But verse 12 reminds us of another important thing to give thanks for. Uh, you know, I would summarize, summarize it this way. Let's thank God when believers' needs are met. I mean, generosity produces abundant blessing in the believers who are being helped. Look at verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. Now we're going to focus on the first part. For the administration of this service not only supplies the want of the saints. His point is to contrast that with what follows next, that the, the thanksgiving is abundant towards God. We'll come back to that. But look at the fact, because people are involved in administering this service, the want of the saints is met. Now, it's not talking about your every wish and want. Not talking about that. When, when we have wants, it's an old English word, the way it was used was talking about your needs, your deficiencies. When, when people are willing to let God work in and through them so that they see it as an opportunity to worship and serve God, the wants, the needs, the deficiencies, the, the struggles of the saints are met. This, this word, this word service, is the same word that's used to describe priestly service. You know, in the Old Testament, that the priests came to the temple and they performed their service unto the Lord. They would go through their period of time and then they'd be released to go back home. And another group of priests would come in. The same with the Levites, their helpers. And they would cycle in and serve the Lord. And then they'd be released. The same exact word is used to describe believers who are leading in worship of God. Now, we don't have to go find the temple. We don't have to go find clerical robes. 
We don't have to wait for certain days and, and perform certain rituals like the Old Testament priests did, as admirable as those things were. We are all, as redeemed believers, we are priests unto the Lord. We don't need a priest in order to go before the Lord. A priest is an intermediary. In the Old Testament, they went to the priests, and the priests offered up their sacrifices for them to the Lord. In many modern religious systems, you don't go directly to the Lord. You go to a priest, and you ask him to make contact with the Lord. But you know what the Bible says about us? When it comes to the scriptures and, and the promise of salvation, it says there is one God and one mediator between God and man. Who is that? Christ Jesus. There is one mediator between the Father and all of his human creation. It is Jesus Christ who came from heaven to earth, who lived and died to forgive our sins, and anyone who repents of their sin and puts their trust in him has the one and only mediator between all of us sinful mortals and the eternal God who alone can forgive sin and give eternal life, Jesus Christ. All of us are priests. We are able to go directly to the Lord. We don't mediate salvation for anyone else, but we can all, as priests, go directly to the Lord in prayer. In fact, we're invited, come boldly before the throne of grace, that you may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. We're invited, come before the throne, come before the altar, come to me and offer up your prayers. Folks, when we give, it is doing spiritual service is an act of worship as a priest of God, as a New Testament believer. We are coming before a holy God and saying, God, I am doing this so that all the world might see. Now, we're not doing it to be seen of men, because if we do, then we've got our reward. We're doing it so that people will see what God has done to so transform people that they're not in love with their things, they're in love with the Lord, and so they're willing to use their things that they're entrusted with on earth in a way that brings glory to Him. What does God do in people's lives that they want to live like that? What does God do in people's lives that they want to give for others, that they want to sacrifice so other people can hear about Jesus? What makes people live like that? Our Father. And we're His children. And we are priests and we can come into His presence in prayer. We come into His presence with an act of worship by our giving. You know, when it says that that service, that act of worship unto the Lord, supplieth the want of the saints. Have you ever been on the receiving end? I mean, I can remember times in seminary, you know, somebody at the church we were attending, they'd come up to my wife or I and just trying to be very discreet. They just wanted to make sure they could meet a need. And they'd come up and say, hey, so glad to see you tonight. We're praying for you. And you kind of get that funny feeling like there's something coming between us, between your palm and my palm. And they wait until you, you know, and you just close your hand and you say, thank you so much. <laughs> you don't want to look. You're just, oh, I can't believe something. And you, you, you say, wow, thank, thank God. God met a need. And as a student, students have needs. I can remember when I was a college student, someone from my home church. He was a well-to-do executive for General Motors, worked for the Cadillac division, did very well in business, one of the most humble, meek men you would ever want to know, a towering man, a giant of a fellow physically. He taught the college and career Sunday school class, and that class blossomed. And he, as an executive, he was able to get a, a new car at significantly discounted prices every, every two years. And he got a small little car for his wife one year, and it came, the two years was up, and they were going to replace it. And you know what they did? They sold that car for next to nothing to my parents, and my parents gave that car to me. Now, I don't know if God put a special hedge of protection around that car. Some of you that are old enough might understand. It was a Chevrolet Vega. 
I saw pictures, we pulled out photo albums over the holiday, and I looked at my baby blue hatchback Chevy Vega 1976, four cylinder engine that had those brand new cast iron sleeves that were the cure all of cure all problems for Vegas. And you know, God used that family to practically give that car. I mean, my parents paid for it, and then they gave it to me. I drove that car for six more years, put another 120,000 miles on it. And for a Chevy Vega, that was an act of God, you know? I mean, drove that thing through the rest of college and the rest all the way through seminary because they knew I had a desire to be able to be involved in local church ministry out in the chapel ministry in different churches that really needed help. They knew I wanted to be involved in the Bible club ministry and I needed transportation. They knew that if I was going to go to seminary, I needed a job so I could not only help pay for college but start saving money for seminary. And being on the receiving end, do you know what an incredible blessing that was as a 20-year-old young man? Wow. I still thank the Lord for my parents and their generosity, and I thank the Lord for that family who just said, we want to bless somebody. It's only money. If, if, they, if, if it can be a help to them, if it can accomplish more good for them than what it would sitting in a garage or driveway for us, wow, let's give it to somebody. And they did. And it was an incredible blessing. And we need to thank God when believers' needs are met, not just when it's our needs being met. We, we can always thank God for that, right? But don't we get excited when somebody else's needs are met? You know, college students, they still in these days, they still have needs. They're still looking for tuition money. They're still struggling to make ends meet and working two and three part-time jobs on campus and all the studies and, and church ministry they're involved in. There might be somebody that's um, got a young family. Young families are always up against it. All the expenses, you know, especially when you have limited income and maximized expenses when you're raising those young kids. What a blessing to help somebody like that. You know, there's just so many opportunities. And this passage reminds us that there are incredible blessings for which we ought to thank God when believers' needs, their real wants, not, not their wishes and wants, but their, their lack is provided for. And we should thank God when he uses people to meet those needs. Generous giving meets real needs because it is an expression of love for others. God loves me so much, I want to love others like he's loved me. It's an extension of God's grace through us to them. God has done so much for me that I don't deserve. I want to find a way to pass along that blessing to somebody else who has a need. It's an expression of humility in our part before God. It's God that has provided for my needs, and I desire to be used of the Lord to help meet someone else's needs. I want to let God use me. It's not, look what I did. It's, look what God did. I'm just so thankful to be a conduit for that. And we should thank God when the needs of believers are met. But don't you want to look at the last couple of verses in this passage because it reminds us of another thing. That we should thank God for His praiseworthy work. And what we talked about, it's praiseworthy when God's people give. It is praiseworthy when God's people's needs are met because somebody else gave. But ultimately, those things pale into significance when we look at the fact that we should thank God because He is ultimately praiseworthy. Generosity results in God being glorified and thanked. I mean, that's, that's ultimately why we don't do our giving for other men to see. Otherwise, we have our reward. I mean, if people go, ooh, and, ah, wow, mmm. You just got your whole reward all dumped in one, one basket right there. That's all there is. It's done. But if we give so that God gets the glory, I mean, somebody might know that you gave. It's not like it has to always be impossible for anybody to figure out. You don't have to enlist the CIA to hide the fact that somebody gave something to somebody. But you don't do it to receive attention. You don't do it for the praise of men. You do it for the glory of God. And when people do give generously when people's needs are met because of love and grace and humility 
That kind of generosity results in God being glorified and God, uh, God's people offering up thanksgiving to him. Look at verse 11. Because we're going to look at a, a part of verse 11, a part of verse 12, and then verse 13 to 15. Uh, verse 11. You have been enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Now, what does he mean? God has worked and allowed you to have the resources and the motivation to give generously. We received the offering, we delivered the offering, and when it was delivered and it had its intended effect, people spontaneously broke out in thanksgiving to God. I mean, they were thankful for the people that gave it, they were thankful for the people who delivered it, but they broke out in thanksgiving to God for what he had done to motivate those people, to have trustworthy people who cared enough to risk their lives to deliver it to meet the need causes through us thanksgiving to God. Look at verse 12. For the administration of this service, that is the fulfillment of this offering that was being delivered to the saints in Jerusalem and Judea, not only supplies the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. I mean, it wasn't just thanksgiving. It was abundant thanksgiving by many different people who were lifting up prayers and glorifying and thanking God for all he had done. Is that a good thing? Ultimately, what is the highest purpose of humanity? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. It's the chief end and purpose of mankind to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And only God's redeemed people can fully do that. Humankind who do good things because of God's common grace, they bring some glory to God in a limited sense. But those whose lives will eternally bring glory to God are those who've been redeemed and who love Him and want to serve Him and thank Him. Look at verse 13 to 15. Verse 13 says, while by the experiment of this ministration, I mean the execution of this gift offering, they glorify God. Now, notice the next phrase. They glorify God because you've given this offering. Somebody delivered it. They've received it. They glorify God. Notice what the focus is. They glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. You know what caused them to glorify God? When they saw people who said, I know and love Jesus. Jesus loved me. He gave himself for me. I want to give myself for Jesus. Because he has saved me by the gospel, I want to obey the gospel. I want to live a life that is surrendered and obedient to him because he is my Savior and my Lord. He's the one who saves me. He's the one who keeps me. He's the one who directs and controls me. He's the one who's waiting for me. He's the one that I sing of, my love for him, and I look for the day when I'll be with him. And they glorified God because these people's profession of faith worked out in real life. You could tell it was the real deal. It was the powerful, authentic. These people professed Christ and it showed that God had done a spiritually transforming work in their heart. You obey the gospel. You lived out the truths of the gospel. For you, it means it is more blessed to give than to receive. Glory be to God. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. Look at verse 14. The importance of thanking God for working in people's hearts who receive it. Again, it comes back to this. It says, and by their prayer for you, who long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. They can see the grace of God is working in those givers in exceptional ways. And in a, in a unique and overwhelming response, it says, They long after you 
for or in light of the exceeding grace of God, that abounding grace that's worked in you. God's worked in you in tremendous ways, and they long after you. I mean, you long for somebody. You, you think about them. You look forward to meeting them. Now, my wife is downstairs in Children's Church this morning, so unless any of you tell, she won't know that I say this. I don't want to embarrass her. So I'm sure I can count on all of you. Absolutely certain I can count on you, right? But as we were going through those photo albums uh, this holiday weekend, we looked back, we found, we found some old photos that go back to high school when I was thin. <laughs> some pictures when uh, I was in college and I was still thin. And uh, just looking back at some of those pictures and seeing pictures of my wife when she was a college cheerleader, you know, homecoming queen, seeing her pictures working with Bible Club and in ministry and, you know, seeing her working at Camp Kobiak as a counselor. That's when I first laid eyes on her. Didn't have the sense to date her quite yet. The Lord worked that out a few months later. And just thinking about all of that, you know what, when I went to college my first semester, this is way before cell phones, way before email. Um, you know, the only way you could use a phone was either dropping the coins in, one after the other, after the other, after the other for long distance calls, or you might get approved to have a calling card account with AT&T. And you'd dial up and you'd dial a, a 3,000 number digit, you know, to get in there so you could, then you could dial the 10 digits for the area code and phone number. Do you know? How many letters my wife wrote to me in the first semester of college? Well, she was finishing high school that fall as she graduated early, and I was my first semester at college. I saved them. I actually took a magic marker and wrote in consecutive numerical order the number of each letter. Now, I wish I still had them somewhere in one of our moves. They found their way into a, a, a basket, but 88 letters in four months. Do, do the math. You know what? I longed for her that fall. I longed to, any woman who would write me that many letters late at night after going to school all day and working a part-time job and coming home and doing all her schoolwork and writing letters by flashlight. Anybody that would write me 88 letters deserves me to be paying a lot of attention. And praise God. Yes. June 21st, 1980, became official. And we've celebrated uh, 37 and a half years together as husband and wife. But you know what? I longed after her. And you know what? Believers long after people that God uses powerfully in their lives. They longed after you for the exceeding grace of God that was manifested in you. But it ends with... the. the Something that even tops that. It ends with verse 15, that we should be thankful for God's work in the world through Christ. Look at verse 15. Thanks be unto God. Not, not just for what we were able to do for God. Not just for how people responded when something was done for them through the work of God. But thankful for what God himself did directly in only by himself. Verse 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. What is that unspeakable gift? It's not a gift that we're not supposed to talk about. It's a gift that no matter how much we talk about it, we could never exhaust it. We, we could never write enough about what was done. We could never speak enough. We could never do enough. I mean, chapter 8 of this very book, verse 9, it, it speaks... Um, and I was thinking it was chapter 8, verse 9, and I got the wrong verse. Well, that would not be good. Uh, verse, here it is. For you know, I was looking at verse 8, that's why. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the gift, the undeserved gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. That though Christ was rich as the 
creator of the universe, as a member of the eternal Godhead, he became poor. I mean, he brought himself down to low estate, took upon himself all the limitations of humanity, and through that poorness, that poverty, both figuratively and literally, he was poor in that God chose to live like man, but he lived a poor life. His family struggled. And as an adult, even in ministry, he had nowhere to lay his head. He, he slept on borrowed pillows and borrowed beds in, in friends' homes because he was about his father's business. But he did all of that so that we might be rich. Not the bank account, not the car, not the house, so that we might be rich in having received the grace of of God that gives us the gift of eternal life that has no price tag you could put on it and can never be stolen, can never be taken away. Folks, abundance and thanksgiving are meant to go together. And for the Christian, they go together perfectly in the context of Christ inspired, love-motivated generosity that meets the needs of the saints, that accomplishes the work of God, that brings glory and people praying and offering thanksgiving to our great God. Aren't you thankful? Don't you want to join me in giving glory to God for all that He's done? Let's let His heartbeat of generosity be our heartbeat and share with people the greatest gift of all, that Jesus Christ came to earth, lived and died, so that they might have spiritual riches and eternal life with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Lord, this passage of Scripture has so much there. And Lord, I pray that we could absorb a, a fraction of it, that we could put into practice and implement as much of it as we can understand. And Father, we thank you. We want to give praise and glory to you. We are so grateful for all you have done for us, so grateful for what you have done in others, so grateful for what you have done through others to minister to us and meet needs. And Father, may you find us willing to be your servants, to be used to meet the needs of others. And we thank you, Father, above all, for that unspeakable gift, Christ himself, that a loving Heavenly Father loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, God. We praise and glorify your name. We thank you because of Jesus Christ and through all that he's done to make it possible for us to be your children. Amen.